last time we talked about the Carnot refrigeration and heat pump cycles, we had the coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle if it was a Carnot related to the absolute temperatures at which the uh, you were the evaporator was operating at the low temperature, and then the condenser, the high temperature. Likewise, for a heat pump, you have an analytic expression for that maximum uh, coefficient of performance. Well, we're going to talk about the vapor compression refrigeration and vapor compression heat pump cycle, the practical Carnot, what's actually implementable. All right, so in review, we had four components, compressor, condenser, turbine, evaporator. The flow of the refrigerant was through each of the component operating steady state. And we had the heat pickup in the evaporator into the working fluid, QL. That would be as how many kilojoules per kilogram of refrigerant flowing through. And the, typically we have that coming in at TL, the same temperature that the fluid's at. Likewise, rejecting heat out of the cycle QH at TH. All right, well, that's not practical. So what do we do is we introduce a, we still have a compressor, we still have a condenser, we still have an evaporator, but we get rid of the turbine and we replace it by an expansion valve. That may seem really bad because expansion valves by nature are irreversible. But it's not as bad as you might think because this turbine wasn't going to be able to produce a whole lot of work anyway. And really what we need is we need to drop that pressure because this split right here is between the high pressure side and the low pressure side. We just have two pressures in our refrigeration system, high pressure side and low pressure side. And that device, the turbine in the Carnot cycle or the expansion valve really is just to drop that pressure. Okay, then the other thing is the compressor really does not like to take in a two-phase liquid vapor mix. It likes to take in all vapor. Well, the best that you can do is put in saturated vapor. I mean, you could put in superheated vapor, but that's not good for efficiency. It's best to put in saturated vapor, and that'll be a happy compressor. This would be an unhappy compressor in the Carnot. But when that happens, this two doesn't come out saturated vapor ready to start to condense. It'll come out superheated at that high pressure. And so it'll first have to be, if you look at what's happened in the condenser, it'll first have to be uh, converted from uh, superheated vapor to saturated vapor. That's uh, um, dropping the temperature, and that's not going to be good for performance. So T2 is greater than T3. It's greater where before it was the same temperature in the Carnot. So some of that heat that's rejected out of that condenser is being is happening at a higher temperature until it gets down to TH and then it's condensing at that constant pressure. All right, what is not a component so what we're going to do is we're going to have an opportunity for you to answer one question today. So if you get your hand up early, then you're done for the rest of the class, right? So, but what is not a component of the vapor compression refrigeration cycle? Expansion valve, compressor, evaporator, turbine, or condenser? Okay. The turbine, and you're done for today. Thank you for participating. <laughs> What is not a component of the Carnot refrigeration cycle? Yes, sir. Expansion valve. So you're done for today. All right. Very good. The refrigeration coefficient of performance, the COP subscript R, how is it defined? Is it defined as cooling rate at TL divided by the input power? the heating rate at TH divided by the input power, or the input power divided by the cooling rate at TL, or the input power divided by heating rate at TH. Who would like to try? Yes. A, that's the cooling rate, so Q, Q dot at the low temperature, divided by the W dot in, and it really only drives the compressor. So you're done for today, thank you very much. Next would be, what is the heat pump coefficient of performance? Same list, I believe. A, B, C, D are the same options. Yes. B. So 
its uh, coefficient of performance for the heat pump is Q dot rejected in the condenser at that high temperature divided by how much power is required to run the compressor. What is a ton of refrigeration? Who's you heard of the term ton of refrigeration? You have? A couple other people have? Yeah. So take a look at the options here. A ton of refrigeration is the amount of cooling in kilojoules or BTU, the rate of cooling in kilojoules per minute or BTU per minute, specific amount of cooling in kilojoules per kilogram or BTU per pound, specific rate of cooling in kilojoules per kilogram minute or BTU per pound mass minute, or mass of cooling in kilograms per BTU or pounds per BTU, I'm sorry, yeah, kilogram, that shouldn't be for BTU, kilograms per kilojoule or pounds per BTU. Who would like to try? B. It's a rate of cooling. That's what a ton of refrigeration is. All right, what is the definition, or how come they come up with this? It's now seemingly archaic term for a rate of cooling being a ton of refrigeration. How did they ever come up with that? Well, a long time ago, we had ice houses. At the start of refrigeration, it was to make ice. And you would have houses pop up in different cities or factories that would make ice, right? And you may still hear of that term, ice house. And then they would make it, and they would buy the equipment to make so many pounds or tons of ice. So what's a ton of ice? A ton is 2,000 pound mass. That's what one ton is. That's where we get the term ton of refrigeration. So they're thinking, okay, how much ice can I make? How many... Um, um, Tons uh, can I convert from saturated liquid to saturated solid? And what they did was they sized it, not that you had to cool it and then turn it into ice, but that it would be already at the point of going from saturated liquid to saturated solid. So it would go from zero degrees C saturated liquid or 32 degrees F saturated liquid, either one, two, zero degrees C saturated solid or 32 degrees F saturated solid. Now, ice typically when you're buying it is le lower temperature than 32 F. It may be 10 degrees F or 15 degrees F, all right? But this is just the predominant amount of cooling. The rate of cooling has to be to, to pull it out, to get that to solidify, to freeze it. Okay, well, if you take a look, the, the amount, the latent heat of fusion, uh, different terms like latent heat of melting, you'll see that too, for water at that point of uh, freezing, 0 degrees C32F is 334 kilojoules per kilogram or 144 BTU per pound. You'll see these numbers all over the literature. Here's pulled out of a website where they give for all a bunch of products if you wanted to freeze them turn them into from saturated liquid to saturated solid. And here is that common number 334 and 144 in different units. Okay. Somebody says, uh, where in our textbook can I find these numbers? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause. And if you have your appendix or if you have your online computer and you have your appendices online, could you reproduce that number? Can you find that number? Or can you calculate that number in some way, shape, or form? Well, let me pick it up here. Let me ask this question. Somebody could say, we don't want the latent heat of fusion. That's like uh, either melting it, turning it from solid to liquid, or from freezing it, turning it from liquid to solid. Maybe I want to go from uh, liquid to vapor. I'm a little more familiar with going from liquid to vapor. That would be the latent heat of vaporization. Or you could think about condensing, but often we think about heating it to boil. And uh, that term in our textbook would be something like HFG. Do you remember that? Latent heat of vaporization. Somebody says, I want to boil water at one atmosphere pressure. We would look that up, it would be about 100 degrees C, uh, 212 degrees F, we'd get a value, 
and somebody says, I think I know where to find HFG in the textbook at 100 degrees C or 1 ATM. And I don't remember the numeric value, but it, you could you could also get H of G minus H of F. What did the G stand for? Saturated vapor. What did the F stand for? Saturated liquid. Isn't that the same thing we're doing here? Don't I need some latent heat of fusion? That would be like solidification, making ice. Or latent heat of melting, that's the opposite. You know, so if I went from H, the, now the subscripts get a little funny here. Either I go from vapor down to liquid. So that would be something like go from liquid down to solid. Something like that. But then I have a little S to F. Or maybe I've seen textbooks use I to F. HF minus HI. Why is the I? I don't know. Ice something solid. Okay. So to, to try and find in our tables, we would say, well, can I find H of F at zero degrees C? Can you find that anywhere in our table? Did anybody find H of F at zero degrees C for water? That is the first table you spend a lot of time in. When you took Thermo 1, table A2, isn't it? Okay, well, you say they didn't give it to me exactly at zero. They give it to me at 0 0.01 degrees C. Close enough to zero degrees C. Why did they give 0 0.01 degrees C instead of one degree C? Why, why in this first table A2? Hey, your old friend, don't you remember Thermo 1? First table you went into. The first entry in that table, the first line. Why didn't they just put zero degrees C? Why did they have to make a 0 0.01? What is special about this temperature and this pressure? No, that's not a vacuum. Well, it's below atmospheric pressure. You're right, your state of vacuum. But it's the CP, the critical point. No, good try. It's the TP, the toilet paper point. <laughs> Wrong T is for something other than toilet paper point. It's the TP is the right little two letters. Triple point. What's special about the triple point? All three phases can coalesce in equilibrium at that temperature and pressure. You can have liquid, solid, and vapor all coexist at that temperature and pressure. That's the only point that it can happen at in equilibrium. All right. Anyway, that's close enough to zero degrees C, so I'm looking for this saturated liquids enthalpy. Now all I need to know is saturated solid at zero degrees C. I didn't say this book made getting that number easy. What you do is go to table A6. There is the same temperature, close enough to zero degrees C. You come over here and you look saturated solid, but that's internal energy, saturated solid. Why did they put an HI? Hey, that's, that's what they chose, subscript, didn't they? So what's this number? So we're going to do the heat of fusion, it's saturated liquid minus saturated solid, so I have to worry about a negative of a negative number. And I get 333.4, not exactly to four significant digits, but it's, it's in agreement. Is it not? Good enough. All right. Now, if you said I want to do that in the USCS, United States Customary System Units with degrees F, and here they switched it. There is the not triple point, or, uh, but this is the triple point. Uh, but there you go. You get this minus that, and it's close enough to 100. And, what, what, what did they say it was? 144, 143. All right. 
We continue on our game of questions and answers. Those that already participated are out. A ton of refrigeration equals this many BTUs per minute, this many BTUs per minute, this many, this many, or this many. D is correct. Now, this is pretty good because what does this number look like? Pi. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be pi. How about this one? R bar, molar mass of dry air. And, well, you have 200 or 1, and you probably remember in your equation sheet it's available. But how did we get that number? Well, you start off, you say the rate of cooling will be, I'll take that mass, I'll have to pull out that change in enthalpy, that 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 uh, heat of uh, solidification or fusion, or even sometimes called melting, and then we're going to do it in a certain time period, okay? And that time period is one day. So basically they're saying, I could leave that as a symbol, delta T, okay? They're saying one ton of water, and I'm going to go from saturated liquid to saturated solid, that's that heat of solidification, in one day. That's the rate of ice production known as a ton of refrigeration. That's how they sized the systems and sold them. Kind of like archaic term, like how, how big, how, how powerful is the engine in your car? They rate it in horsepower because they were replacing horses. And somebody says, I have a system, I'm, I'm running it with 15 horses. Can you sell me an engine that I can get rid of my 15 horses and that'll do the same amount of work, you know, do the power? I said, sure. I have an engine that's 15 horsepower equivalent. Well, the same thing here, a ton of refrigeration. So you have 2,000 pound mass and what was it? 144 uh, BTU per pound mass. And you're going to do it in a day. A day is 24 hours. And then each hour has uh, 60 minutes, so you could put uh, 60 minutes per uh, hour, per hour. And so we get rid of the hours, we get rid of the pounds, we get BTUs per minute as my final unit. And somebody have a calculator? Oh, look at that. How come I didn't cover this up? Did you look at that? He, no, he didn't. He didn't even notice that the answer is right in front of him. <laughs> Oops. I'm supposed to cover that up. All right. Well, I don't have the answer for this one. So you're still out. Yes, you're a friend next to you. It's 211. 211. You do the same work, and you'll find it's 211 kilojoules per minute. All right. Um, if you wanted to, some people will put a ton of refrigeration is uh, 12,000 uh, BTU per um, hour. You just multiply the 60 times 200, and there you go. Let's continue on. Well, we have the states labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, for the refrigerant going through these components, we want to put them on property diagrams, especially when we solve problems. Our favorite are temperature entropy and a new one, pressure enthalpy, the pH diagram. Why? Well, first of all, let's put on our dome. And then right away on their TS diagram, we know that we really have a high pressure and a low pressure. And that's what a high pressure line looks like and a low pressure looks, line looks like on a TS diagram. What does a high pressure line look like and a low pressure line look like on a pH diagram? Flat lines, pH, ed, pl. It's very simple. All right. But what does the dome look like? It looks like this on a pH diagram. Okay. What was at the top of the dome right here? It was the... CP, critical point, what's right up here at the highest pressure, the critical point, it's typically shifted a little bit conceptually or visually away from the, the right part. It's, it's here, okay? And just like we have a sequence of saturated vapor states, we have a saturated vapor states, and then just like we have a sequence of saturated liquid states to the left of the critical point, we have a saturated liquid states to the left of the critical point. All right. Well, let's put state one, saturated vapor at low pressure. State one would be right 
here. And one is right there. How about state two? It's after the compressor. Well, if you had 100% isotropic efficiency, state two would be straight up. But if you had some efficiency of the compressor, maybe it's 70% or so, or whatever, lower than 100%, well, then the compressor would not be straight up. It would be kicked over a little bit. So we'd have 2S and then 2 actual. We still get up to the high pressure. Take a look. Notice that the temperature coming out after the compressor is higher than the saturation pressure of the fluid in the condenser. And if your irreversibility is greater, your exit temperature coming out of that compressor is even hotter, higher temperature. All right. Where is state three, saturated liquid, at that high pressure? Isn't that right there? Isn't, well, first of all, I should have shown state two. This is kind of a 2S. And this is two actual shown out here. Um, this the, the 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 constant line of constant entropy on a pH diagram is the hardest one. It, it's just sloped like I've shown. It's going to end up in the superheated vapor region, 2s or 2 actual. Okay. Then we could show state three is saturated liquid. And then state four was the hard one going from three to four on the TS diagram because it's a dashed line kicking out down the state four. But guess what it is? It's really easy on a pH diagram, isn't it? Because from three to four, what property is constant through the expansion valve? Enthalpy. So it's straight down, but we don't want to draw it as a solid line straight down on a, even on a pH diagram. Why? Because Solid lines on our property diagrams indicate it's internally reversible, but dashed lines on our property diagram indicate to us the convention is that it's irreversible. And from three to four, it's irreversible. So we still use a dashed line, and this is solid. So there you go. That's what it looks like on both the TS and a pH diagram. I encourage you to use those diagrams and anticipate people will talk about high pressure side, low pressure side, how much superheat, et cetera. All right, continuing our game here. The pressure in the evaporator is either high or low. I got it, you have to raise your hand and I catch my attention, not just call it out. The pressure in the evaporator is low. You're done. The temperature in the evaporator, it's low. You're done for the day, right? The refrigerant leaves the compressor and then flows to either the expansion valve, the evaporator, or the condenser. Yes. Flows to the condenser. At this point, I like to tell a little story. It's been a number of years now, five or six years. I had a student about this point in the semester say, Professor, you're wrong. I worked in the industry for 10 years or five years before I decided to get a mechanical engineering degree. I've done this in, in the automotive trade, worked in air conditioning systems and repairing. And the, the refrigerant, when it leaves the compressor, goes to the evaporator. I know that. I say, OK, time out. Just listen to me. We'll talk about, we'll continue the conversation later after the lecture is over. By the time the lecture is over, you come up, oh, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. And you know what? All the time I worked in that industry, my concept of what was happening was wrong. <laughs> I can't believe it. This is tricky stuff. And believe me, there's a bunch of technicians and working out in the industry. And I'm sure that they're really confused at times. And they're but there's also some technicians that really know it hands down. And if you ever get in the industry, you'll know it because there are some really good technicians that know what's going on. And you can easily get confused in air conditioning systems. Why? Because think about it. Evaporator. Oh, that's where you're changing something into vapor. True. We just studied 
power cycles boiling water. We didn't boil water at low temperature, did we? We boiled it at high temperature, high pressure. And now we're working in refrigeration, and where we're changing it into vapor is at low pressure and low temperature, just opposite of what we had in the vapor power. So take your time. It's a little challenging at first. Make sure you sort of play it over and over in your mind, what's happening in the evaporator, what's happening in the condenser, etc. All right, next one. Refrigerant leaves the condenser and flows to the... A. It leaves the condenser and goes right to that expansion valve. Very good. Flow through the evaporator, probably the hardest question, one of the hardest I get today, is either isothermal, isentropic, or isenthalpic. Flow through the evaporator. Or put D, none. Isothermal, absolutely. But in your mind, you have to remember, it's constant pressure. And let me go back and look at that property diagram again. Here, either this one or that one. Since it's low pressure, I'm coming in, and maybe this is 25% quality. X at 4 is 25, meaning 25% by mass is already vaporized. But I have 75% by mass that's liquid. That's going to provide the cooling. But as I continue to evaporate it, turn it into vapor, by absorbing some heat, it's all at the same pressure. Hence, it's all at the same temperature. It's isothermal. That's right. Is what's happening in the condenser isothermal? Mm, because T2 is greater than T3, not really. But it is constant pressure in the evaporator, isn't it? Yep. All right. Flow through the expansion valve is isothermal, isentropic, isenthalpic. Isenthalpic, it's constant H. Very good. Refrigerant is cold coming out of the compressor. Condenser, expansion valve. Expansion valve. This is one of the trickiest concepts. You have this little device. You bring in some high pressure. You take out low pressure. I can understand the pressure drop. No problem. You come in a saturated liquid, but if you put your hand right there before that expansion valve, because it just came out of the condenser, it's pretty warm. Let's say that this condenser has to dump heat to air. This is air flowing over, and it's a hot summer day. You want your air conditioner system to work on a hot summer day. Let's say it's 120 degrees F. The engineer designs it for a really extreme hot summer day of 120 degrees F. If your car is going through Arizona, and I think some of those states have these ridiculous temperatures, right? Like it got 100 degrees. And think about the pavement. It's even hotter the air on the pavement where your car is operating. So think about that. It's not uncommon for the engineer to say, I better be able to reject heat at 120 degree F air. Okay, that means that refrigerant in here is probably about 140 degrees F, 20, 25 degree F delta T. That means this saturated liquid right coming into this valve, 140, 145 degrees F. Do you want to touch that? Not really, it's hot, it's warm. But then I put it through this expansion valve, and I drop the pressure. How much cooling was happening in here? None. But what happens to that temperature? Oh, it drops down to like 50 degrees F. No, that ain't going to work. There's nothing like that that exists. You can't take fluid that's 140 degrees F, just drop the pressure and all of a sudden it's now 50 degrees F? Come on. Or can it work? It does work. So this is why refrigeration and some other topics in, in thermodynamics are so hard to understand and grasp. So what's happening 
Think about this. You have liquid. Did it take energy to take liquid water, water, and boil it to make it go to vapor from saturated liquid to saturated vapor? Did you have to put energy into the system? Didn't change the pressure. You just boiled it. Does it take energy? Sure. Where's that energy going on a molecular level? It's breaking these intermolecular bonds. Water, liquid water kind of sticks together a little bit, and to break it apart takes a little bit of energy, right? And so that's where it goes. Well, the same thing here is you have it in liquid state. There's some bonds that hold it together. You drop the pressure. It says, ha-ha, I'd like to go into the vapor state. Great. But instead of being provided some heat from the outside, you're going to have to sort of take it from your neighboring molecule. So you, you want to be in a, a vapor state, but you drop the, some of that energy that uh, is breaks some of the bonds that it, some of it becomes vapor, but then everything is lower temperature because you do have to conserve energy. Think about that from a molecular point of view and intermolecular forces, and I think that'll help you. Okay. So, refrigerant is cold coming out of the expansion valve. Very tricky concept. Another good diagram to help you on that one would be our uh, pressure temperature diagram, PT diagram. Hey, haven't seen that in a long time. Our old friend, it kind of scooted up here, got to a point, scooted up here, went to a point, went up like this. That point just continues on. Uh, this point was called the CP. This point was called the TP. Um, all out in here was uh, gas or vapor. All over in here was all liquid. And all over in here was all solid. And what you do is you're dropping the pressure and you were saturated state. So there you were. You were on that line between sat saturated liquid is right on that line. And as you drop the pressure, its temperature want to drop. Some of it will vaporize, but it'll cool off. It'll stay. And so now I have a two-phase mixture. Seven, uh, about 20% will be uh, vapor. I'm sorry. Quality will be about 20%, meaning by mass, about 20% of it is vaporized. And then 80% is liquid still. So this... Pressure temperature diagram will help you understand that. All right. Uh, we don't have time to go through the nuts and bolts of this problem. So what I'm going to do is just show it. But I think you have all the skills. Did I share with you that uh, add-in? I think I posted it today. So you can actually download the add-in and then play with it. I encourage you to still look up properties in the tables by hand. And then use software until you're very comfortable with it. Okay? The software is not going to do anything you can't do by hand. You can do it all by hand. It just saves you a lot of time when you get comfortable with the software. All right. But you would answer questions like, oh, give me that rate of heat transfer. Give me the power input. Calculate the coefficient of performance. You can then change the problem. You can make that compressor not perfect has some isentropic efficiency, then, hey, it's going to take more uh, for the, I forget what it does, for the cooling rate, it probably goes down, takes more power, the coefficient of performance degrades. Plot on the temperature entropy diagram, as well as a pressure enthalpy diagram. These are drawn to scale as best can be done in Excel. This would be state one. This would be state 2S. This is state 2 actual with that lower efficiency for the compressor. Then this would be state 3. This would be state 4. You could take a look visually. That quality looks to be, oh, about 25, 30% at state 4. On a pressure enthalpy di uh, diagram, this is state 1, state 2S, state 2 actual. More superheated at state 2 actual because of the low efficiency. This is state 3. And then straight down with a dashed line. With a dashed line. Gives me state 4. All right. Heat pump. 
Well, what's the difference? You still have a vapor compression system. You still have a compressor, condenser, expansion valve, evaporator. The goal, the desire, this is the difference. This is what you want. You want, uh, often we have heat pumps in homes and they run in the winter. And so it's a cold outdoors and you want to take some energy from CPS, electricity, put it into a system to provide more heat to the interior of your already warm house. It's not just going to be electric resistive heat where you just multiply the, the, the power that you purchase from CPS times 100% and that's the, the Q dot heat into the house. That's electric resistive heating. But here what you want is you'll take that power you purchase from CPS, multiply by a coefficient of performance of the heat pump, which is going to be greater than one, typically a lot greater than one, and you will get more heat into the interior of your house for the same amount of electricity you purchased. That's why we have heat pumps. All right. So this is what we want. So the coefficient of performance of the heat pump is this uh, QH or Q dot H, depends how you want to run it, divided by the specific work into the compressor or the power to run the compressor. Okay. What is the heat pump coefficient of performance, A, B, C, or D? B, it's the heating rate, that's that Q dot at the high temperature, divided by the power input to run the compressor. Very good. It's for the same condenser and evaporator operating conditions. Can you show that the coefficient of performance for the refrigeration system, if you just added one to it, it would be the same numeric value as the coefficient of performance for the heat pump system? Sure. <clears throat> Here's the quick derivation. You start with what is the coefficient of performance for the heat pump? It's Q dot H divided by W dot. Okay. You recall the energy balance. The energy balance says what comes in here, W dot, plus what comes in there, Q dot low, must all go out, Q dot H. That's true. So Q dot H is equal to W dot plus Q dot L. Once we make that observation, stick that into our definition right here. Notice that we have W over W, so 1 plus Q dot L divided by W dot. You say, hey, I've seen Q dot L divided by W dot. That's my coefficient of performance for refrigeration cycle. Hence, the coefficient of performance of heat pump is 1 plus coefficient of performance refrigeration. Somebody says, didn't we study this with the Carnot? Is that true also that the COP refrigeration Carnot plus one is equal to COP refrigeration Carnot by the heat pump? It is. It's just now you're playing with temperatures instead of that, and you just follow the math. It's all doable math. All right. If it wasn't, it'd be a surprise. So that wraps up our discussion of vapor compression refrigeration as well as vapor compression heat pump systems. So we have four major components. Solve enough problems, just like memorizing them. Uh, we are interested in the coefficient of performances, and this is a nice little fact. So with that, I'm ready to move on.